but there's a long tradition of these types of uh, uh, voices of conscience. Um, so I just immersed myself in the world of St. Sabina and, and spent time with Father Mike and, and his peacekeepers and the community there and tried to learn as much as I could. We love you on Windy City Live. Yes, we do. Tell us, how did all this ha happen? How did this come about? Well, I play me. I play Val Warner in Chirac, which is really cool. So when people see this movie, they are literally seeing Val, and I am a reporter in the movie. We talk about the violence, but what can we do personally? I think we got to be engaged, and I think engaged in a number of things. In our block, in our home, in our neighborhood, we got to be engaged. We got to fight the issues. We got to fight a government that is abandoned, you know, whole communities on the south and the west side. Um, we got to fight a governor who's cut out every youth employment program who's cut out violence prevention programs, who's abandoned um, our communities and the poor and the vulnerable. And I think we've got to reach out to our brothers on the street and love them and respect them and help them, not just demonize them. My participation is only because of Mr. Spike Lee, our leader, our director, and uh, he reached out to me and blessed me with the opportunity to be in this film and said that his mission was to save lives in the south side of Chicago. I'll just say, like, it's first of all, the history of coming to Chicago and telling my jokes as a, as a young cat. I'm 37 now. I started about almost 15 years ago. Elroy taking me under the wing, let me do some jokes here and there for the radio stations and all that kind of stuff. Than that, we are more than that. We're greater than that, and I feel like in places like this, or Chicago, or whatever you want to call it, the hood, whatever you want to call it, like it's too much attention dwelled on the negative. I learned that no matter what you do and how much of a genuine heart you have, and if you're coming from a good place, people are going to criticize if they don't agree with what you're doing. have you been standing here? Not too long, like an hour. So this, we're moving in fast. This is a good time. Yo, what's up? It's your man, Tony Schofield from 106.3 Chicago's R&B, and you are watching Men on Higher Learning. Now, I used to hang around with some men that was into some higher learning. It just wasn't that kind of higher learning, but I got myself together now, okay? What is it that you do in your quiet time, in your meditation time, that allows you to bring us the films that you do? I sit courtside in Mass Square Garden, world's most famous arena. So it's creating static electricity with that and that guy.
such a feelings oriented person. Um, you know, I'll get into kind of the logistics that I go through in terms of world building, but when I'm first thinking about my world, I always start with the philosophy. So what do people believe? And that's very much a mirror of our society, is it? you know, and then you know, as we as we kind of all consider, okay, where did we come from? What is our world? Then we've all kind of come to different determinations on, you know, our origins and, and things kind of break down from there. And so that's kind of really where I start my world building process with the philosophy. And it has to feel right. And I have to really make it something that people can connect to, not only in the specific reality that I'm building, but also in today's society. So for instance, in my world, I go all the way back to the beginning, and so for me, it has to feel right. It has to, there has to be kind of a holistic connection for me to my world. And I've been able to, you know, root out some, some issues just by reading through it and, and thinking and feeling, you know what, this isn't right, this doesn't fit right, this is not the right tone, the right perspective, and things like that in terms of creating a strong and solid world that I feel like I want to put out there to different people. <coughs> That sounds good. Um, do you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. So, so I, I love how um, Tefra said that we, we did have some pre-discussion, and the great thing is that all three of us are so different. So you're going to hear three distinctly different yeah. uh, points of view on this, and, and if you're a writer, you might even have your own. Um, so for me, I do almost like a lucid dreaming kind of experience when I start out with my world building, where I really kind of sink into the character. Which character am I? Am I observing? Am I one of the characters? What does it feel like when I'm there? What does it smell like? What am I hearing? So I'm a huge fan of music, as you heard. Or if you came in late, I started out by playing um, one of the themes to my book score, because I write books, but I also write the book score that goes with them. What? So that goes with my book series. Uh, and so, yeah. so I mean, I'm like super nerdy, guys. So, um, <laughs> so when, I, when, I, when I'm seeing these stories play out in my mind, I'm also hearing the music. So I kind of close my eyes and I go there. And I'm like, OK, if, if I'm there, or maybe if I'm watching it on the screen, what am I seeing? What are the things that I'm seeing in the background? What's going on in the soundtrack? What's going on in the score? What's going on with the sound effects? What am I hearing? What am I set? What am I smelling? How do I feel? Do I have goosebumps right now? Is it cold? So that's kind of where I start with it. Um, and that kind of goes out from there. It's more of creating the whole experience and not just um, telling what's happening, but showing what's happening and trying to hit you from all different um, corners of your senses. Nice. Yeah. And I feel like I'm somewhere in between. <laughs> I'm very much, if, if you guys are Harry Potter fans, I'm a Ravenclaw. Which means that I'm, <laughs> which means that I really approach my world building by building out this whole society in my head. Um, I do a lot of graphs and charts. I'll build a political structure. I'll build out kind of like what's the magic system, who are the people. I'll build out the gods, what are their powers, how they're interrelated to the faith and the belief of the people there. Um, so I'm kind of looking at it from a big scope and then kind of then drawing in to say, what is happening in this world? But it's a lot of planning, a lot of documentation. I'm guilty of writing a 20 page outline for my <laughs> <laughs> so That gives you a little. And spreadsheets and org charts. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. Um, I have multiple documents for um, every world I build because I feel like I've got to live in that world a little bit before I can tell the story of the people who are in it. So that's my approach. Yeah. Okay. And I realized that I didn't even introduce myself rude. Um, <laughs> I'm Ronnie Davis. I'm also an author, but I write contemporary stories about black girls falling in love. And my first novel is out in um, November this year. Uh, um, I, but you know, contemporary we do world building as well. So like, this is for anyone who wants to write anything. You have to build it in your story, whether it's contemporary or historical or whatever. So anyway, that's about me. Let's go on. Um, let's talk about um, how some of the world aspects of world building help you dive into deeper with your stories. I do write these extensive outlines, but I will say that they never limit what I can 
do with the story. Oftentimes I will write extensive outlines and things will change completely. Right. Or I thought something would work and I realized as I started to write it, okay, I, there's another thing that's gonna happen here. Um, it's a little bit of letting the character start to decide the story for themselves. You kind of had this thing planned and then you change. The outline I always look at as a sort of loose guideline. Um, it's a goalpost to kind of keep me going through the story, but it's not something that um, restricts me to writing just that way. Um, and to answer your question, Ronnie, I think, so in my story, Kingdom of Souls, um, there's this um, thread of magic. If, you, if you're not going with magic, you can uh, sell parts of your life to get magic. So you trade your years to get magic, uh, which is, ooh, scary. <laughs> um, but the main character ends up trading years of her life to get magic for a really important She's trying to save some stolen kids in the kingdom and stop a bad guy from doing harm. Um, and something that really informed her characterization was why would she, you know, give up part of her life? Like that had to be like a really strong reason. Um, magic is not that important to give away your life or, or just something that's not important. So I think it's one of those things where I had to say, here's this premise of someone trading your years for magic. Why would they do that? And that informed so much of what the story would develop into later. Yeah, that's great. And I'm probably, you know, I outline. So I outline all my books. I don't think I'm as extensive as, as Rita, but um, I do have some pretty heavy outlines, and then I separate my outlines into two. So I have bullet points, and then I have kind of just story notes, and then as those bullet points literally go into each chapter. So I keep building each bullet point until they're paragraphs and then until they're pages. So there's that. But then that's just, for me, that's just the basic architecture. So you can have bullet points, you know, as many as you want, but what is the, you have to really dig into kind of what Octavia said. What are they doing? How are they doing it? What are they feeling? And so for me, when I get stuck between the bullet point phase and the creative, all right, now let's tell the story phase, I'll, I'll look to music, so I actually have one soundtrack that I'm doing um, for my book too, and that's more production. So under, under my brand, I have a, a consulting arm, I have my indie publishing arm, and then I have a production arm. So I'm starting to weave all of that together. So the production arm, I do audiobooks, and then I'm doing some music for uh, some of my books in a new animated series for children that I'm working on too. But. I digress. Um, <laughs> so kind of going back to that, so a lot of times, so connecting those dots, right, between architecture and the creative, let's kind of work with we'll stay. I, I work on doing music, so I'm like, you know what, I need a song. There's lots of songs in my books too, so a lot of times the characters will kind of be folky and they're, and they're singing and they're dancing, and so I'm like, why don't I put this out, you know, to a soundtrack? So I, I work on the songs. I also do a lot of drawing, which for, I don't know if it's too, but I'll sketch out the world. I'm like, especially there's there's one part where um, a few of my characters are traveling, and I was like, wait, I can't have bodies of water here. So I had to draw the entire world because I was like, wait, they just hit, you know, like this this body of water. I was like, no, is there a bridge? And what am I going to call it? So, <laughs> so <laughs> drawing all these things. So that, and then I also, you know, I do a lot of corporate work, and so what I'm always doing in the corporate world is mission, vision, core values. And that's what I do with my characters. So for an example, the whole root of my Clown Town Adventure series is the belief of darkness and light. And so I go all the way back to the beginning. So instead of darkness just being dark, in the beginning there was darkness, and darkness covered the earth, but this darkness was actually a life form. And the way that light was born was that the darkness became unhappy, fought within itself, it sparked, and these little bubbles of light were trapped, they were funneled through a black hole and burst the whole realms of light. So light is not actually this completely opposite of darkness, it was almost a product. And so I've also named the darkness Iona Draconis, and that belief system is actually where the wicked temples come from in my book, is to worship this entity, and there's also some other connections in there. So that's how I start. And then now we have the interpretation of darkness coming from the different themes. And so I also present a host of questions. So why why are the evil people evil? What do the witches believe? What do the sorcerers believe? What do the fallen stars believe? Um, and where are they ranked in, in terms of interacting with each other? And 
then we look at the people of light. What do the high celestials believe? What did the villagers believe? What did the fairies believe? And then how does that change throughout, you know, their clans, their species, their, their you know, fantastical beings, things like that. And I, I want to um, circle back too and say in response to, to the two of you that do do outlining, and for me that's just like, abstract, so let's just make stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have to go back and outline afterwards, so if any of you are aspiring authors and taking notes, you still need an outline. <laughs> maybe you don't start with the outline, maybe you do start with the outline, but ultimately you have to have that for continuity. So I'm going back and I'm like, okay, wait. And, then, and I'm kind of like putting my puzzle together before, I mean, after I've already broken up all the pieces. So, um, so whether you go from it from the front or from the back, you still need all those essential parts because otherwise you're gonna have a story that has holes in it and people are gonna catch you. Your fans are gonna be like, so then wait, what? So where did this person come from? You always have to answer those questions. You always wanna ask those why questions. You see those little white uh, orbs, circles that are floating? Those are actually neutrinos that are not getting stopped. And actually, right now, a trillion of them are going through your body. Did you feel a neutrino pass? Did you feel it pass now? You felt it? No, you didn't. going on that people are fighting against. Um, so I feel like we have to really heal that generation and teach them to love the freedom and teach them that we don't have to stay inferior, you know, to, um, you know, they just like to go with things. Like, they don't really like to disrupt. Just go along with, because that's what they had to, you know. To yeah, they were murdered for it, lynched for it, all right. sorts of issues. Exactly, which is, you know. Complacency. We can't blame them for the way they are because we didn't go through that. But at the end of the day, it is, you know, I feel like clashing and causing. You're absolutely right. Um, I feel confident in saying that all humans have some generational things that don't happen. Grandparents and grandkids don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. But what's important about our history is the fracturing was designed into this racism. It was designed to keep us separated and to make us very fearful of each other. And It's set up so that you would have that pipe on the prison. So I have eight grandchildren. So when they come to my house, like, Papa, why you got us reading or writing this stuff? I, you know, I, I, I want them to understand. My wife said, don't, you're messing them up. You re traumatizing I said, no, I'm trying to make them aware of how to navigate through. You need to go to school and learn how to read, write, what, read, write, arithmetic, three R. But you also need to know, case point, my daughter was gonna go to DC. I said, you can't go to DC unless you read this book about mm -hmm. lives across the earth. Because the tourist's gonna tell you something. The tourist guy's gonna tell you something different. So we have to just instill in them what I call re-seasoning them so that they can navigate through all of the stuff that traps us and gets us into that pipeline. Um, there are some studies, sociological studies, that show that in one block, one city block, uh, Department of Corrections has made a million dollars off of individuals in that neighborhood by arresting them and sitting them. Uh, so that's largely disgusting. And I agree with you, sir. I was given and educated a false narrative about history. I am 37, I'm gonna say like 33 is when I really start to uncover uh, the whitewashing that was given to me and misunderstanding and all that, what do you call it, sunken place and all that stuff that I had to go through to really find that self-love and that nurturing spirit and what it feels like to be in family and community. Uh, so I appreciate that. From an operational standpoint, how can we 
shift where they can get their money so that they stop looking at us as a cash cow. Um, and so looking at us as like, okay, well, we need to keep them enslaved in order to be our bottom line. So it's like if we change how we talk to the powers that be, it's like, okay, fine, instead of doing like this mass incarceration, what if we talk about re rehabilitation and change how you get your money from this, then that will perhaps open up a broader conversation that they'll be ready to listen to. Because I'm all about the revolution, but uh, I, I don't know how quickly that will happen and like hurt people will continue to hurt people. And I think that's the quickest way until we sort of take it amongst ourselves and say, you know what, just enough is enough. So I'm really trying to figure out how to be a member of my community. Um, living in an apartment is hard to get to know people. Um, I grew up in a house in Kansas City. I knew everybody on the block. But moving here, um, I've just committed. I knock on doors and I hand out my business card and I just talk to my neighbors. Um, I invite them to things. Um, some lady in my neighborhood started a walking group that meets every Tuesday. So um, I'm trying to start going to that. Um, it's kind of hard when you start your own business. But um, I'm committed to unifying my community so that we can help build together and change policies that affect our ability to start our own business in our neighborhood, um, that affect our school board and how teachers are disciplining our children. You know, but I also want to talk to parents. I'm not a parent. I have my ideas on what we should do with children, but I want to hear from parents and understand how they feel about it. It's just identify what skills do we have that we think could benefit another person, someone who looks like us or someone uh, you know, who has a child who looks like us, and just think about what those things are, and then move forward with trying to figure out how you might be able to share that with someone else. Beautiful. And lady in the front. I would like to say there's so many people of, non-people of color in America, we need to tell everyone we must vote. We, that's the only power that we really have that doesn't cost money. Get out and vote. It'll take a long time. Maybe we can change some things or help some things along. Encourage everyone. You're not going to be the neighbor's door. Did you vote? Get out there and vote. And I'm just signing some Don't Be Afraid Part 2, the prequel. Just signing a little Mind Things of a Dirty Zombie. I got um, all kinds of books at Anomalous Comics. Uh, my name is Comic Book Chris. We have, as you can see, we have little hoodie dolls, which is my next creation. Um, we have even have Texans for CBD bath bombs. Um, we have children's books to help kids not be afraid of the dark, of monsters under the bed, uh, monsters in the closet. We have uh, books with he um, children's books that deal with heavy topics like loss and death and dying to help kids. Um, little brown, black boys and girls that you know my, are statistically proven higher to experience uh, certain tragedies. I wanted to do a kids book series that has you know those tragedies in it and has uh, representations for our culture. WakandaCon 2018. This has exceeded any and all expectations that we had. Founded and produced by the Barthwell family, consisting of Sister Ali. I think the plan from here is a nap. It's a nap and a glass of wine. Uh, Maybe I, two or three. Yeah. <laughs> and brothers David and Matt, along with producers Lisa Beasley. No one gave us a con manual. <laughs> <laughs> probably wouldn't have worked anyway. So. Right, exactly. So. We probably might have to write one. Uh, there you go. Hey, that's how you do it. And Taylor Whitten. Uh, we are glad to be partners in this. But we are right to die, so thank you all. Um, <laughs> the Conda Con reveled in the excitement created by the release of the Black Panther movie and help write another phenomenal chapter in the history of Chicago. Wakanda Khan presented three days of celebrity guests, you. You're in it. You look great. leading industry experts, 
a gamer's paradise, loads of family-friendly fun, cosplay, and so much more. All right. Inspired by this wave of Afrofuturism, the Cousins Empowered Optimist Club of Chicago, CEO, a group of educators and community activists from the Morgan Park area of the city, organized a workshop on the mysteries of electricity, taught by Morgan Park High School alum, Professor Anthony Jackson. Who knows where the first battery was discovered? But it was found inside of a pyramid during the time that Napoleon took his army into Egypt. They talk about Afrofuturism. We've already been there. Professor Jackson currently serves as a technology consultant and is a lifelong technology innovator and enthusiast with degrees in both physics and computer science from the University of Illinois and Governor State University. What I want to do today is just introduce some of the uh, mysteries of electricity. He is currently collaborating with the Cousins Empowered Optimist Club of Chicago to provide a 12-week youth coding skill development workshop to be held at the Salvation Army Croc Center. Inspired by fellow Morgan Park High alum Dr. Mae Jemison, the first black female astronaut, Professor Jackson and the CEO team will teach youth how to build their own computers we need your support and participation in this movement to bring coding skills to American youth in Morgan Park and the surrounding area. To find out how you can help, contact the Cousins Empowered Optimist Club of Chicago at 312-479-7702 or visit CousinsCoding.com. But don't you understand? Just as the character of Lieutenant Uhura of the Starship Enterprise inspired Dr. Mae Jemison to explore space, Wakanda forever! Is Monday morning a struggle to get out of bed, into the swing of things? Well, don't worry, you are not alone. Join us for thought-provoking, stimulating, and mindful conversations on higher learning with Zelda Speaks for your Monday morning mindfulness session on Blog Talk Radio, The Female Solution, Mondays, 7.30 until 9 a.m. Be sure and send your ideas, thoughts, comments, and suggestions. Experience mindfulness moments with the mindfulness slash stress relief coach, Zelda Speaks. And thanks for sharing the mindfulness moment tip of the day. Stay on purpose. Stay empowered and stay tuned to your next session of Mindfulness on Higher Learning with Zelda Speaks. Make it a mindful day. And thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Julie Myrasta. I'm with the American Heart Association. And we have been up to our ears in sweetened beverage tax. So I so much appreciated the five-minute meditation today that allowed me to get back to my center, take a few deep breaths, and really focus on what's important.